there have been dramatic positions taken by faith-based groups, such as United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Christ, and the U.S. Mennonite Church, to divest from corporations that aid the Israeli occupation and continue and contribute to human rights abuses against Palestinians. This panel looks at the role and significance of the churches in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, the origins of this role, their landmark achievements and challenges along the way. Our panelists include Philip Farah of the Washington Interfaith Alliance for Middle East Peace and David Wildman of the United Methodist Church's General Board of Global Ministries. Philip Farah, he actually spoke here in November uh, at our annual conference. His presentation today will be an extended lecture on that subject. He works as a national resources economist and lives in the Washington, D.C. metro area with his wife and three children. He's a founding member of the Washington Interfaith Alliance for Middle East Peace and co-founder of the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace. He's addressed audiences across the U.S. on Middle East peace and social justice issues, and so he's a very informed expert to speak on the subject of the panel at hand. David Wildman is the Executive Secretary for Human Rights and Racial Justice with the United Methodist Church's General Board of Global Ministries. He also relates on behalf of GBGM with grassroots partners in the Middle East and Afghanistan, which he visits regularly. Among his many activities and associations, David helped found United for Peace and Justice in October 2002 and the U.S. Campaign to End Israeli Occupation in 2001 and serves on its steering committee. He also serves in the World Council of Churches Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Forum Core Group. Uh, we will actually start the panel today with David Wildman. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see uh, uh, friends and, uh, and many people here uh, for this discussion. <coughs> I'm going to jump right in. Uh, thank you for the invitation from the Palestine Center and also the warm welcome. Uh, we're starting Black History Month, and so uh, what better time to talk about nonviolent moral actions like boycott, divestment, and sanctions? So I think this is, it's not that we should stop talking about it in March, but uh, <laughs> this is really an appropriate time. And if we think about 50 years ago that Malcolm X uh, was assassinated, the movie on Selma is reminding us of many, many nonviolent struggles um, that I think it's really good for us to take some time today and uh, focus on boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and what role of the churches. Uh, <laughs> folks may remember that the white clergy in Birmingham, when King uh, came to town and was working with folks, uh, wrote a letter to him and uh, said, you know, we have our own way of dealing with things here. We're, you're just bringing in these extremist, radical kind of ideas. Uh, so he wrote a letter that wasn't Amos an extremist for justice, wasn't Jesus an extremist. Uh, so in fact, if we're called extremists, I think we should claim that, that boycott, divestment, and sanctions are extremely passionate actions for nonviolent moral economic change. And churches are struggling and uh, moving in that movement. I had the privilege of being here in this room 10 years ago in 2005 as part of a panel here with the Palestine Center talking about why divestment. So I thought it's kind of nice to be back 10 years later and reflect what's happened with the churches. So that's going to be kind of the framework of how I'd like us to kind of reflect on things from 10 years ago. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of background on the Second Intifada. I'm not going to go back to all the history of uh, the discrimination and dispossession that has taken place. But I do want to say for us as churches, one of the reasons that boycott, divestment, and sanctions has taken off, I think, is in part the log in our own eye as churches in the United States, which is the U.S. government. Since 1970, the U.S. at the United Nations has used the veto more than the other four permanent members combined. Now, one-third of those vetoes were to block international action against apartheid practices in what's now Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in what's now Namibia, 
Uh, that is not as well remembered as the fact that over half of the vetoes have been to block international criticism of the Israeli government's practices uh, in the occupied territories and in its uh, neighboring areas of Lebanon, uh, Syria, Jordan. It's when you block international communities' efforts that civil society, which includes churches, turn to nonviolent actions like boycott and divestment. And so a significant part of the anti-apartheid movement's strengthening of its efforts at boycott and divestment in the 70s and the 80s was connected with the U.S. government, often joined by Britain, blocking international efforts to challenge the apartheid regimes. And so I think it makes sense right now that there's also civil society joining together. Um, so I just put that as a backdrop. Um, I want to go back and think about some of the first divestment efforts in the United States were at around 2001, 2002. Uh, some of you may remember uh, with the second intifada erupting and being quite violent. Uh, there was the uh, caterpillar bulldozers leveling a whole area of Janine. Uh, refugee camp. And I think what happened was in the midst of widespread nonviolent action, direct action of Christian peacemaker teams that have been there for many years, the newly formed International Solidarity Movement, uh, the ecumenical accompaniment program in Israel and Palestine of the World Council of Churches, you had all this nonviolent direct action to say we need to stop the injustices and we need to do it in nonviolent ways. And how can we be involved? People logically said, well, if companies are involved in doing harm, we need to take it to the companies as well. And uh, then in 2004, you may remember, was the first resolution of the Presbyterian Church to calling for phase selective divestment. It was actually one month before the International Court of Justice ruling uh, that condemned the uh, apartheid wall. In 2005, you had the uh, Palestinian uh, Civil Society call for uh, justice, freedom, and equality. That was the spark of the uh, BDS movement around the world. And you also had Sabil as a Palestinian Christian organization doing a conference in Toronto on morally responsible investment. Uh, the attacks on Presbyterians that included arson threats and uh, obscene phone calls and all sorts of other violent threats had made Sabil itself wary of talking about divestment. So they talked about morally responsible investment. And if you find out companies are doing bad things, you have a responsibility to do something about that. Um, I'm going through things pretty quickly here. Uh, as you know, it was a 10-year struggle for Presbyterians to get to the point where last June uh, of June of 2014, they did vote to divest uh, from Caterpillar, uh, Motorola, and HP. I was part of the conversations with those companies. Uh, so if people have questions, I won't go into that now, but there was a number of us from several different denominations that joined together uh, to file shareholder resolutions, to meet with the companies, to write letters. Uh, and it was after prolonged refusal by these companies to actually change anything uh, that uh, they voted to divest. Methodists also have struggled. Uh, we divested it the week before the uh, Presbyterian meeting uh, from G4S, a British company that's involved with uh, pri private prison work. And it was particularly the uh, prison contracts that they had with the Israeli uh, government in terms of housing Palestinians um, <coughs> under detention, often without trial, uh, that led to that divestment. Now, before that, I just want to note that um, in 2012, an interesting thing happened. Uh, as the boycott and divestment and sanctions movement was kind of taking off from 2005 forward, and predecessors on campuses, uh, many of the campuses had divestment movements in 2002, 2003, um, here in the United States, uh, churches often focused on divestment, partly because we have uh, pension funds, we have holdings, so we actually have something to divest. Uh, most students don't have any investments, so, you know, they've already done that. Uh, so it's really easy. Uh, um, and uh, I want to say part of it is like churches realize we've done this before and it works. So why not use a tactic that's nonviolent, that works, and that we have some practice with? I mean, that's just a, a logical kind of thing. Um, so 
in 2012, the focus and push was on divestment. And yet we also put some language in and there was quietly some efforts to say we should be doing all of the nonviolent moral actions. In ending military aid, that's a form of sanctions, if you think about it, uh, in terms of calling on the U.S. government. Sadly, the U.S. government has not listened uh, very well. Um, and boycott in terms of settlement products. Uh, and in fact, both the United Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church in 2012 adopted calls for boycotts, focusing on settlement products or on companies operating. Uh, the Methodist one was a little broader than the Presbyterian one. I raise this because I think that one of the struggles I want us to wrestle with here is uh, how attack groups, and I call them attack groups um, because they're really, their main agenda is to silence moral, nonviolent actions and voices within the churches. They're not seeking peace. They are not seeking other actions. Um, they are seeking to silence. And so I call them attack groups. I think you know many of them. Um, they had framed the debate that boycott was seen as too connected to the horrendous uh, boycott of Jews in Nazi Germany in the 30s. I want to say something about that. The boycott is actually against any form of discrimination. So it's the discriminatory, racist, apartheid practices of the Israeli government that are being boycotted. It's actually an anti-discriminatory thing. So to be charged with discrimination uh, is really t an attempt to reverse the framing. And for a long time, I think we accepted that. And I think the challenge now for us as churches and um, our allies, I realize it's a broader audience here, um, but I am speaking for the churches, is to understand how important boycott is, along with divestment, in challenging racist practices. Look what happened in Montgomery. It was not a boycott of buses, that this was a terrible technology that needed to be eliminated from the city. It was not even against that company. It was against the racist practices of that company and of the state that allowed that to continue of segregation. That's what it was. They actually wanted to use the buses, but only if the buses practiced just policies. And so I think today the challenge is to welcome attacks and use those attacks to say we are against all forms of discrimination. We are against anti-Semitism and we're against the identity-based discrimination of Israeli checkpoints, of Israeli laws, and there are dozens and dozens of laws, and we don't have time to go into all of those, that treat people differently strictly on the basis of identity. That is the challenge for us, and to understand that boycotts are actually one of the most strong and moral actions that we can take in nonviolent, loving concern for everyone to end the discrimination that Palestinians have faced for so long. That you have a law of return if one's Jewish, and you have a right of return that's denied if you're Palestinian. So you see, so a boycott is saying that's wrong. We should have the same practices for everyone. And I wanna just kind of put that out there for us as a challenge. Now, fast forwarding through history, uh, we just, I really feel like I'm jumping through this. Uh, in 2009, Palestinian Christians, after uh, 18 months of discernment, uh, launched the Kairos, uh, what's known now as the Kairos Palestine document that was uh, drew insights and, and from the uh, Kairos document in 1985 in South Africa that the churches issued to say apartheid is a sin. And you can either uh, uh, try and justify it, so any church theology that tries to justify apartheid is wrong, um, and anyone that tries to kind of reform it, like state theology, uh, uh, state theology, church theology, and then prophetic theology were the three categories in South Africa, that uh, you had to challenge and resist the theological justifications for this. And in the same way Kairos Palestine was saying for Palestinian Christians and for the world, we need to challenge the sin of occupation. 
taking someone else's land, uh, taking resources, building settlements, all not only gross violations of international law as it's been framed over the last century, but deeply immoral, unjust actions that divide people from one another and discriminate and violate all sorts of moral laws as well. And that's why we as churches have to be a part of boycott and divestment and sanctions efforts. So I want to now just say, where did all this come from? Well, partly it comes from the Bible. And uh, I don't know if you realize, but really all of this is, comes from the Bible. And I want you to think about the, the concept of repentance. That in biblical language, in many of the stories, sin was when people turned away from God and turned away from their neighbors that were in need. So you kind of like turned away. And repentance was a call to turn back, turn away from the sinful activities that you were partaking in, the unjust activities, the violent activities that you were participating in. And so repentance was like a boycott. Give up those awful practices. Stop robbing your neighbors. Stop discriminating. And so repentance, when you hear repentance, and those of you who have Bibles that want to go back, you can kind of uh, check that out. It really is a call to boycott, a call to divest. And I have a couple texts. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I thought I'd just read a couple from Ezekiel, uh, the 18th chapter. So I'm not making this up. This is uh, <laughs> Ezekiel's asking, you know, there's a problem. And it was this chapter is, should we have collective punishment or not? If one person does something wrong, there are biblical stories where the whole family, the whole community suffers for the wrong of one person. And Ezekiel's saying, no, wrong actions are punished. Repentance, turning from those actions and doing good is welcome. And it's based on your actions that you are judged, not on your identity. Do you see? So here again, it's an anti-discrimination, anti-collective punishment sense in Ezekiel. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? So this is a call. Boycotts are a call for us to turn and for our neighbors, uh, companies, the Israeli government, to also turn. Repent. See that good? Could say, so we have to say, like, boycott, yeah. divest, <laughs> turn, you know, uh, this is, you know, working with the Greek and the Hebrew together, you know, is, uh, <laughs> turn away from your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses that you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord, repent and live. Ezekiel was challenging the government of his day and the people of his day out of deep love to stop discriminating, to stop taking others' land, to stop going the ways of the empire and the ways of might makes right. And I think that same challenge is what Palestinian Christians, the Palestinian civil society, and churches are taking up today when we call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. I have just a few minutes. I don't know. Is somebody keeping time? I could go. Uh, um, but I do want to just say that the same uh, thing is in the book of Revelation. When John is writing about uh, Babylon. Now, when he was writing, there was no Babylon that was an ancient empire. But if he wrote about the Roman Empire, he would be executed. So you have to see the code language. And he says, uh, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. And he goes on to kind of condemn Babylon. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her. That's divest, by the way. You know, that's the <laughs> Greek, uh, my people so that you will not share in her sins. Now, this boycott in uh, Revelation is a full academic and cultural boycott. 
Uh, this is not where the churches are at yet, but I want to just invite us. So what happens when this boycott and divestment takes place? The merchants of the earth, I'm reading from verse 11, 1811. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their goods anymore. See, there it is. It's boycott and divest. The music of harpists, musicians, flute players, and trumpeters will not be heard in you again. It's a music boycott, a cultural boycott. So I think that we have in the Bible some challenges to us. <clears throat> I want to close then with why am I putting out this kind of boycott and pressing churches to say, let's examine and claim these instead of kind of being fearful about it. Um, how do we, in the international community, take on a country? Israel is a democracy. Its people vote. That repeatedly elects a government that supports, subsidizes, and protects and expands settlements, illegal settlements. So how, how do we challenge a democratic government? I mean, that's different than challenging a dictatorship, challenging a monarchy. I mean, there are many unjust governments. But when it comes to challenging democracies, and there's varieties of struggles over the definition of that term, um, I want to suggest that boycott was a, ch a, a tactic used by colonized peoples. Uh, India, if you think of Gandhi and the non-cooperation non with wrongdoing, so that these efforts were efforts of colonized peoples to say, we will not participate in your ongoing harm and wrongful uh, procedures. And that, therefore, a boycott right now is also an act of love to challenge the Israeli public to kind of wake up in, in a loving, nonviolent way. Uh, now, it may not feel that way, um, but I want to suggest that it is um, away and if you think about the different boycott movements and if you haven't done this but look at the history of the anti-colonial movements uh, in South Africa, uh, in uh, India and a number of other places. It also enables us um, to broaden our involvement. Uh, I was talking with a friend from Africa today. Now there's not a lot of churches in Africa that have investments the way that churches here have. Uh, divestment is not necessarily something that makes sense. But boycott is something that they can participate in and look at how do, what does one boycott uh, settlement products, companies, uh, as part of this broader movement. Uh, <clears throat> let me finish uh, with a couple more things. And that is that um, in Ezekiel, again, he's one of my favorite prophets in various ways, although there's some wild stuff in there, um, he talks about the false prophets that are whitewashing and providing lies to distort things. And in fact, that describes the efforts to say that United Methodists and Presbyterians are engaged in violent threats against Israel or engaged in anti-Semitic activities. We are against uh, taking people's land. We are against discrimination that has checkpoints on identity, what I've been talking about. And I keep going over this because I think it's important to stay on message of the suffering of people at the hands of a discriminatory system that has been seizing land. And last year, uh, there were uh, more home demolitions and more settlements than in years in the West Bank. So apart from the horrors of Gaza over this last summer, there is a need to challenge this, and the boycott and divestment ways are a way of challenging also the whitewashing that happens in our churches and in the various attack groups and in US media and certainly in the halls of Congress. Um, I want to just uh, read something here from Ezekiel. Because they lead my people astray, saying peace or peace process when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Therefore, tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. 
That was Ezekiel a long time ago. So the wall today also can't be covered in whitewash. It cannot stand. And through nonviolent actions of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, it too will fall. Thank you. Squeeze it a little bit, and I try to change some of the pictures so it doesn't look too familiar. It didn't work for me. I don't know. Um, so these, uh, this is a summary of what I'll be uh, talking about. What's our group, the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, PCAP? The role of faith communities and faith leaders in emancipation struggles worldwide and in the US. The Palestine call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Western church's involvement in Palestine. Church activists, uh, resolutions are not enough. Many of the church activists are saying, you know, we've passed millions of resolutions. It's now time to act. Support for BD, uh, BD and some S in the churches. Uh, the other side, Christians for Israel. And then which voice carries? Is it the silent, the so-called silent majority, or is it us, the activists, who seem to be so small? Uh, and very importantly, where is the Palestinian American voice? And this is really, you know, uh, this, this presentation is really in many ways directed at us, the Palestinian activists, who, uh, w where do we belong in the movement in general, and in particular with regards to the churches. So the Palestine Christian Alliance for Peace, uh, I'm going to skip over this because I'm not going to. Uh, so we were approached some time back in 2012, actually, a number of us, a group of us here in, in uh, Washington, uh, by friends in the United Methodist Church who were like David. David, by the way, I call him uh, the father of BDS or Mr. BDS. He's been, he started talking about boycott and divestment long, long before many of us did. Uh, so we were approached uh, and asked, uh, um, you know, where is the Palestinian voice? Uh, we are uh, agitating for a divestment uh, by our church. We are hearing from all, all sides. We are hearing from the uh, Zionists, uh, the pro-Israel folks. We are hearing from Zionist, uh, Zionist Christians, uh, Christian Zionists. And we're hearing also from JDP, Jewish Voice for Peace, who is congratulating us on our um, proposed resolution. But you know, the Palestinians are simply not there. And it is, a, it is a fact that, you know, we are maybe activists here and there, but we are not, th there is no real voice. There is no address. Uh, and, and this is why we started uh, a, our group, the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, at first really uh, to address the need for a Palestinian voice, which would carry, which would have um, credibility with the churches. Now, you know, we are a very, very small group. And, uh, you, know, you know, Christian Zionists number in the millions, and they are extremely well-funded. Uh, but, and, and then there are networks of people like the United Methodist Kairos Response and several other United Methodist uh, groups like the Methodist for Social Action, the Israel-Palestine Mission Net Network of the Presbyterian Church, there is a uh, United Church of Christ, uh, Palestine, Israel Network, and many other groups, far bigger than the Palestinian activists in this country, um, uh, but, but much smaller than the Christian right, than the uh, uh, Christian Zionists. So um, is, is that a reason to give up? Uh, and that's one of the things that I'll uh, be addressing. Um, part of the presentation is to is, is what we our group uh, our narrative to the churches why is it that we are asking you to really go beyond mere resolutions and uh, actually put your mouth or put your money where your mouth is and be actively involved in the struggle and because there's a lot of resistance in the churches 
you know, the idea of divestment and boycott is a negative thing. And churches, you know, don't want to do negative things. They want to do positive things. They want to invest. So it is a struggle. And they don't want to rock the boat. And they don't want to look like they are anti-Semitic. And they don't want to be prov provocative. So we talk about many leaders who were faith leaders who played extremely important roles in the emancipations of their people, like uh, Chief Joseph of the Nape Tafsir, uh, and Muhammad Abdo of Egypt, Gandhi, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, in Germany, Dorothy Day, uh, the founder of uh, Catholic Worker, a tremendous fighter for uh, peace and justice and for the rights of uh, the working class and the oppressed people, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, uh, Monsignor Oscar Romero, Bishop Abel Mozarewa, who actually happened to be the uh, Archbishop, the Methodist Bishop in Zimbabwe, and who played, a, he, he was actually, if anything, even more important than uh, Mugabe in the struggle initially. All of these were faith leaders who played great role in, in the emancipation struggles of their people. And they were very, very provocative. They, they, did, they very much rocked the, the boat. These were not passive leaders. Uh, they, they did not at all avoid controversy. So the church has played an extremely role historically in emancipation struggles in the United States. The abolition of slavery, civil rights movement, ending the war in Vietnam, uh, BDS movement against South African apartheid, Kairos, South Africa, which inspired the Palestine Kairos document that uh, uh, David referred to. And this is, by the way, the document. I, I'm sorry I don't have uh, copies, but if you, I encourage you to Google Kairos Palestine and download it and read it. It's a very, very powerful document. Uh, the sanctuary movement to end the U.S. support for Central American dictatorships and death squads, very strongly based in the churches, and many more struggles. A and there, please remember the word sanctuary and sanctuary movement. That, to me, is a very key word. Um, and it is a key word for reasons that I'll make uh, clear later. Many of the people involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict have recognized the importance of the, that the churches play in uh, the struggle. Uh, you know, Congress is occupied territory, more occupied than my country. <laughs> and, uh, and the media is not much better. And actually, a large part of the s churches but the only real fora in this country for progressive uh, voices is the universities. I'm too old to be an activist with the universities and the churches. Chomsky recognized this, Edward Said recognized it, and many other activists, even environmental activists. Uh, they, when you get the main, mainstream churches, you are reaching the mainstream. It's much more than the student. Even though many things start with student movements, the churches, when you really are able to reach the church uh, communities, you are in the mainstream. And, and mentioning uh, Congress, you know, many of us believe it's a lost cause. I mean, you know, we, we encourage people to lobby on this issue, but frankly, I mean, you, you saw. Uh, when Netanyahu was here, he got far more uh, ovations, standing ovations than I think any other American president. And uh, so we focused on the grassroots because that's, and, and Martin Luther King and others have recognized that historically, historically, everything that's good in this country really starts in the streets. And so another narrative that we have for the churches is, look, you know, in all emancipation struggles, it, there is not a single emancipation struggle where nonviolence was the only route. And like Gandhi said, you know, um, cowardice is not an option. 
for the Palestinians, the status quo is not an option. It's going to be either violence or nonviolence. And which side are you on? And nonviolence does not mean being passive. It means being extremely provocative as Gandhi was. Gandhi was in your face provocative and extremely stubborn and very provocative in his uh, confrontation of injustice in his country. You know, uh, many of you will recognize this person on the right, but do you know who this was? Anybody? Um, Subhas Chandra Bose is considered by many Indians as important a leader of the Indian emancipation struggle as Gandhi. And he and Gandhi had huge differences because uh, uh, Chandra Bose um, strongly criticized Gandhi for nonviolence. He advocated violent struggle against the, the, the British. And fortunately, Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's, uh, I mean, there was, it was an extremely violent struggle. And Gandhi, people like Gandhi and Nelson Mandela were the sane alternative to what would have been otherwise uh, total chaos. And that's another message in our narrative to the children. So I want to go back to the uh, issue of uh, uh, sanctuary. You know, one of the reasons, even though we are very small in number, look, Jewish Voice for Peace is far greater in number than we, the Palestinian activists in this country, can ever hope to, 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 to muster. So, so we're very small in number, and we are dogged and terrorized by Islamophobia that exists in our country, uh, in this country. And so for us, it is extremely important that, should, that there should be a sanctuary such as the churches. We are not alone. To many Palestinians who are very reluctant to be engaged in the struggle, we tell them, look, you are absolutely not alone. There, there, BDS is making tremendous gains uh, worldwide. Uh, I think maybe David will tell you about some of them uh, uh, among church communities worldwide. And, and the churches are a very big part of that. It offers hope to the nonviolent struggle in Palestine as well. Because without successes, it's going to be the chaos. And um, so uh, Kairos Palestine, uh, the document that I mentioned was uh, published in 2009. And it is the inspiration for our group. Um, I have to rush through this because my time is running out. Um, so the, the, the churches have been very much involved in Palestine. There have been, uh, yeah, uh, the, the Western churches have had missions, schools, hospitals, serving not only Palestinian Christians. Palestinian Christians are a tiny minority, but also uh, Muslims, the majority of the population. They see for themselves the horrible conditions that Palestinians live through. And, and uh, so, so it is, you know, seeing with your own eyes the oppression and horrible conditions that Palestinians have to. And out of these emerge groups which um, are in solidarity with the Palestinians. These are the, I'm sorry, these are the Palestinian groups, Sabine Palestine Liberation Theology Center, Palestinian Christian Group, and Kairos Palestine, which uh, is advocating for BDS. But there are also the ecumenical accompanying prog accompaniment program, which is an international program run by many ch church advocates all around the world uh, to act in solidarity on the ground and practice violent, passive, uh, violent, uh, nonviolent resistance, the Christian peacemaker team. I want to quote from the uh, CPT, the Christian Peacemaker Team. This is from, they, uh, a lot of what they do is protect Palestinian children in Hebron, for example, who are going to school and facing the insults and the violence of the Israeli settlers protected by the Israeli soldiers. They also help uh, farmers trying to get to their land. Um, uh, and their website, this is the quotation from, I quote, CPT supports Palestinian-led nonviolent grassroots resistance to the Israeli occupation and the unjust structures that uphold it. 
So these are some of the groups that uh, are activist groups on all kinds of issues, uh, on uh, immigration, uh, the rights of immigrants, on uh, uh, gay uh, GLBT rights issues, on all kinds of issues in the United States. These are our natural allies. But these groups are very specifically focused on Israel-Palestine. United Methodist Kairos Response, Presbyterian Israel Palestine Mission Network, United Church of Christ uh, uh, Palestine Israel Network. And they, these are growing very fast. And they are behind, you know, so at the beginning I said we are very tiny and we are overwhelmed by the much larger, the much larger uh, Christian Zionist uh, uh, movement. But the fact is that the Presbyterian resolution for divestment uh, last year immediately hit the first page of the New York Times. Something that, you know, Kufi, which is the Christians United for Israel, meets in Washington, has every single uh, Congress, <laughs> well, maybe I'm exaggerating, congressman and senator come and attend their meeting, and they don't get first uh, page coverage in the New York Times. And there are millions of them, and they are extremely well funded. Our friends, who are relatively small in number, uh, move their church, the Presbyterian church, to divest, and it hits first page news in the New York Times and other leading outlets. This has huge moral uh, significance. And a few days after that, uh, Netanyahu says, addresses the Presbyterian church's resolution directly saying, you know, criticizing it because they know how big a threat that is. This is, by the way, the website of United uh, Methodist Kairos Response who, among other groups, were, uh, are advocating for divestment uh, next, uh, next year, 2016, June 2016. Since Gaza, since Gaza, the number of churches, church regional groups who have signed on to BDS has increased very significantly. Our friends from Jewish Voice for Peace know the impact of Gaza, that uh, after the Gaza invasion, uh, the massacre of Gaza last year, the numbers of um, Jewish Voice for Peace have tripled, correct? Uh, and I think 30 new chapters have grown around the country. Um, so this is Kufi, you know. Kufi comes to town, the Christians for United for Israel, and they have a uh, full house in the convention center, and ev there's a procession of, uh, okay, just one last thing. This is the question. The question is, you know, who will prevail? We are very small in number relative and in resources compared to, to Congress and, you know, APAC and, and, I mean, APAC and all of its friends in Congress. But, you know, which voice carries? Is it the silent majority? Are church fundamentalists uh, able to, uh, for example, reverse the, um, the uh, state laws that now allow gay marriage. Uh, so do not be fooled by our small numbers. I think we can have a huge impact, but we really need to network and be, um, we lack this. And we, the Palestinian community in particular, have to really start being more out there and support the, our friends in the churches who are doing this. Several times you mentioned the boycott of settlement products. I'm wondering uh, how much talk there has been in the churches of going beyond that um, because uh, so many people have shown that the settlements are totally imbricated uh, with Israel. 
uh, that it's, it's almost impossible to distinguish between the settlements in Israel. So um, I know JVP is, uh, is talking about this next step. Um, they haven't come out yet with um, their uh, final policy statement, but I'm wondering about the churches. Um, when are you going to be talking about boycotting Israel and not just boycotting settlement products? Question over here with the scarf, lady with the scarf. Thank you very much. Um, my question is for Mr. David Waltman. Few times you mention about taking land, and of course this is true, but how would you respond to the Jewish communities or some Christians who say, well, this land is given by God, okay? And then, with all what you uh, talk this afternoon, have you also approached the Jewish rabbis explaining this? And what was your response? Th what was their response? Thank you. Two more questions. One more question. Okay, why don't you just start answering? Okay. Um, is this working yet? Oh, it is working. Okay. Yeah. Is it working now? Okay. Um, so on the Catholic Church, I think uh, one of the key areas is uh, a number of the Catholic orders, especially of sisters, uh, the Mary Knowles, the Sisters of Mercy, the Sisters of Loretto, have been filing shareholder resolutions. The earliest shareholder resolutions against Caterpillar over 10 years ago were filed by Catholics. And they work each year with Jewish Voice for Peace and with uh, the Presbyterians until this year. Where they're Whoa. Um, so th there's certainly the act activism on that level. Uh, at the grassroots level, there's also many Catholics that have been involved in Christian peacemaker teams and uh, inter international solidarity movement in terms of direct action. Uh, but in terms of the institutional hierarchy of the church, uh, they have not moved um, on uh, divestment efforts or boycott efforts the way uh, some of the Protestant churches have, or the, the Mennonites, the Quakers, the Methodists, the uh, Presbyterians. Um, so it's still a struggle there. Um, in some cases, I will say that there's an issue around visas, that the Catholic Church is very concerned about visas for many of its clergy and orders that are in the Holy Land. And that depends on the good graces of the Israeli government. And so that does play a factor. Um, but people took great <coughs> hope from Pope Francis uh, stopping to pray at the wall. And so I think sometimes a symbolic action can be much more powerful than necessarily the institutional uh, actions is what Philip was saying about resolutions. Um, I could go on. The second one was about boycott of settlement products. And I think, yes, that's a, that's a very important thing that uh, I hope we can push further to look at uh, a broader sense of boycott. And that's why I was raising that um, when you have uh, – elections that repeatedly confirm a government engaged in prolonged and systematic human rights violations and discrimination and dispossession, then boycott and divestment and sanctions are nonviolent tools that have often been used and need to be used further and in a broader way. Um, so, but I will say that's what's happened is uh, Presbyterians and Methodists and other churches that have taken a stand on boycotting settlement products looked at Gaza and say, well, what was it with the settlement products that caused the horror of war crimes and violations in Gaza? Mm -hmm. uh, they look at the checkpoints and say, how did settle points, you know, then they look at the discrimination and the poverty rate for Palestinians who are citizens of Israel mm -hmm. and say, how are the settlements a part of, and so it's a step in a journey of claiming our, our role in a broader movement for justice. Um, and we need a lot more discussion. Um, the third one was about um, taking land and how do you respond to that this land was given. Uh, I don't read anything in the Bible that says that God was a real estate agent. <laughs> so that's one. Second though, I think all of the covenants that are lifted up are contingent upon faithfulness to God's commandments to not steal, to not covet your neighbor's house and your neighbor's farm and your neighbor's land, uh, to not lie. So. When those things are violated, you heard the words from Ezekiel. He was directly saying to Israel, this is not okay. 
Jeremiah, Amos, all of the prophets, out of love, were demanding that their government be accountable. And so I think today we have to say the same thing, that uh, the Israeli government is seeking a monopoly on state power in the region. That's what part of what the settlement brings. That's not, and so the challenge to that is not to say Jews need to leave. No one's saying that. Uh, but to say that the monopoly on power and the monopoly on violence, and if you listen to the phrases of when will Palestinians renounce violence, no one's asking when will Israelis announce violence, when will everyone renounce violence, except for the Palestinian civil society and churches. We're saying we have a nonviolent platform. And so in some sense, the way to relate to the land is in a nonviolent way. And when you exclude others, uh, that's a form of violence against the land, violence against neighbors, and violence against God. And that is something the Bible condemns. Um, so have I approached rabbis on this? Um, some rabbis, usually the rabbis in Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, I did have one interesting um, conversation with a rabbi when we were talking about Gaza. And I suggested that under international law there should be um, cut off the military aid as a form of sanctions because of the, this was after Cast Lead, not this summer, but five years ago in 2008 to 2009, and said, uh, he actually agreed with me, and said, you know, in the spirit of um, Israel's independence of being involved in its own defense, that he could understand that that might be something, that, you know, he interpreted it differently, but it was an interesting challenge that here was a conservative uh, rabbi that was defending the policies and practices of the Israeli government, and yet acknowledge that a sanction like that might be an appropriate uh, step. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, something about uh, full divestment. You know, this is a huge issue, and the Palestine divestment, BDS movement, they make it clear that, you know, uh, do whatever you can in your community, you know, we actually, in PCAP, our group, Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, we address people, different audiences with different messages, frankly, because there are, you know, groups like United Methodist Kairos, uh, Methodists for Social Action are very, very open to full by bo boycott, perhaps. But, you know, there are other <coughs> groups that, in fact, you know, I mentioned that uh, Christian Zionists are very strong in the kind of fundamentalist churches, but there's a lot of opposition uh, to the whole kit and caboodle, even in the mainstream churches. The, and you know, like uh, when they say, um, we don't wanna do negative things, let's uh, invest rather than you know, do positive investments. We try to steer them even in that direction, saying, look, okay, invest in water purification systems for, for Gaza. Uh, invest in, in uh, um, uh, olive trees in, uh, that have been uprooted replacing these olive trees and slowly you're going to learn you're going to learn that it is a whole system of oppression you know the the uh, bedouins of uh, uh, the negev who whose uh, villages have been demolished for example for the 63rd or 65th time and you know they are citizens of israel proper so uh, to you know to we have to tailor the message uh, to to um, uh, you know, what the traffic will bear, so to speak. Uh, on Catholics, you know, uh, absolutely there's a growing uh, movement on the grassroots. Uh, the, you know, the Catholic Church is very monolithic. It's a bureaucracy, and you can't really, um, uh, you, the decisions have to come from above. But, like David said, there are things happening on the grassroots level. Pax Christi tends to be very uh, open to our, in, and there are churches here locally that have invited us They've shown film series on uh, Palestine and Israel, and, and there, there is definitely movement.